Welcome to the uh, Baylor Innovations uh, meeting. It is uh, 2020 and things are obviously a bit unusual. Uh, we're doing this all virtually. I'm going to give you a talk today on the best treatment for post prostatectomy, stress urinary incontinence. Uh, and my topic is the male sling. Uh, in the background, I have put uh, the cathedral of St. Francis of Assisi from Santa Fe. So at least we have a little bit of, little bit of Santa Fe feeling, but let's go ahead and get started. So when we think about post-prostatectomy stress urine, urinary incontinence, we have to remember that the pathophysiology for what's going on is not necessarily the same for every patient. And as we're doing this presentation, if I look down at my keyboard or look down at the presentation, not looking at you, just I'm trying to orient myself. So remember that we can have damage to the external sphincter. And these are the guys who have really severe post-prostatectomy stress urinary incontinence. They leak a ton. But also there were those men who will have incontinence. But if you were to perform flexible cystoscopy or cystoscopy in the office and ask these individuals to contract their sphincter, they could do so. You would see the sphincter contract and yet they still have incontinence. So these, and these are the individuals we believe who actually have disruption of the pelvic support structures that lead to an inability of the sphincter to adequately co-op the mucosa of the urethra. So these individuals do have sphincter function and yet they still leak. And these are two very different mechanisms that require different treatments, all right? What I would propose is that in the right patient with the right surgical technique, uh, they should do well with a sling to treat their post-prostatectomy incontinence. Again, the right patient with the right technique, I think the male sling is gonna be the best treatment option. And this is kind of my take on things. When I work up a patient with persistent post-prostatectomy stress urinary incontinence, then I wanna uh, delve into their history. I wanna know the severity of their incontinence. I always perform cystoscopy and we'll do urodynamics as needed. The history is important because if a man has had radiation treatment after uh, his radical prostatectomy, then he's gonna be a poor candidate for a male sling. Or if they've had bulking procedures like uh, coaptite or uh, collagen, they're gonna be a poor candidate for the sling. Most important thing is the radiation. We have found over time that men who have had radiation treatment after radical prostatectomy, all else being equal, have about a 50% success rate with the male sling. So history is important. Now the severity of incontinence is really important and the gold standard to measure severity is a 24 hour pad weight test. Uh, now, what is that? Well, you give a man a set of pads in a Ziploc bag, he uses them for 24 hours, give him as many pads as you think he might need after he takes one out of his underwear, it goes back in the Ziploc baggie. He uses those for 24 hours, he brings them all to you after he has completed uh, his testing, and then you weigh the pads. Now, one cc of urine weighs one gram. So the gram weight difference when the pads are dry versus when the pads are wet gives you the number of cc's he's leaked in 24 hours. And that's a great test if it all goes well, but a lot of times it doesn't go well. Patients may not bring back their pads or they forget to put a pad in. It's pretty cumbersome. And so what we use instead as a surrogate is the standing cough test. And the standing cough test was developed by Alan Mori down at UT Southwestern. Uh, and the idea is you take a man, you perform cystoscopy, fill up his bladder with a few hundred cc's of, of irrigating fluid, you know, 150 to 250 cc's of, of fluid is what I do, stand them up and have them do four individual coughs. And if they don't leak any of the irrigating fluid, that's a grade zero. If they leak some drops on, you know, that third or fourth cough, it's a grade uh, one grade two, if they leak drops on maybe the first or second cough, if their if their drops become a full stream, then that becomes a grade three. And if when the guys you know they stand up and they, and they start to leak right then, or they give their first cough and they just gush, well that's a grade four. And as it turns out, grades zero, one, and two are going to be good candidates for a male sling. Now what Alan and I did, Alan asked me to combine my data with his because he developed the standing cough test. He didn't really have any 24 hour pad weight data, but I had a lot of 24 hour pad weight data. And, and the bottom line is when we combined and looked at these things, we found out that individuals with severe incontinence based on their 24 hour pad weight testing 
really correlated with the uh, grade three and four standing cough test, whereas the mild to moderate degree of leakage on a 24 hour pad weight test, that really correlated with the grade zero, one, and two standing cough test. Uh, and so individuals with grade zero, one, and two standing cough test as a measure of the severity of their incontinence, those are good sling candidates. We always perform cystoscopy on an awake patient, I think it's absolutely required because you want to rule out a bladder neck contracture or a urethral stricture. You want to make sure there's no bladder tumors or stones. You don't want to get into the operating room and then find the guy has a transitional cell carcinoma in the bladder. No, the kind of thing doesn't happen often, but if it happens, it's a real problem if you're doing his anti-incontinence procedure right then. Also, you want to fill up their bladder and stand them up for the standing cough test. So cystoscopy is important. Urodynamics, we use as needed. If the patient's history suggests a detrusor instability or urgency incontinence, then we'll get 24-hour pad weight testing. Or if we're going back on a repeat incontinence procedure, we'll get 24-hour pad weight testing. So male slings, best in a patient with mild to moderate stress urinary incontinence, that standing cough test grade zero, one, or two, no history of radiation after their radical, good function of the external sphincter, uh, when you perform awake cystoscopy, no bladder neck contracture, that kind of thing, that's the patient who's best for a stand, for a uh, male sling. And when I talk about the male sling, what I'm talking about is the uh, Boston Scientific product, the Advance XP male sling. And in that picture, you can see the, the helical needle carriers as well as the sling in the background. On that mesh, on the arms of the mesh, there are these plastic chevrons or barbs, and that locks everything into position. And this is what the thing looks like in the operating room. The thumb of my right hand is over the mid portion of the sling, and that's what we're going to affix to the spongiosum. The arms of the sling are covered by that white material until you pull that sheathing off. And when you pull the sheathing off, it deplays those chevrons or those barbs. Now, this is going to be the surgical technique, and the surgical technique is focused on the Advance XP male sling. I really believe having done slings in the US, having done the Coloplast product, having done the Boston Scientific product, Having done slings outside the United States, when I'm doing teaching surgeries in other countries, using other sling options there, I really believe the best sling that's, that's available here in the U.S. for certain is the Advance XP, and I think that's true outside the U.S. too. When we're doing the Advance XP, doing the male sling, the patient's going to be in lithotomy position. You put their hips about 90 degrees. I do put a catheter in the bladder. You make a midline perineal, perineal incision go down through the subcutaneous tissues, get to the volvospongiosis muscle, and then open that up in the midline. And then there's going to be this condensation of fibers that insert into the spongiosum. That's the central tendon. We have to identify the central tendon during our dissection, and then you mark that point of insertion into the spongiosum. And that's important because, as it turns out, where the central tendon inserts into the spongiosum that's where we're going to want the proximal edge of the mesh. And I'm going to show that to you in, in subsequent slides. But you identify the central tendon, you mark its point of insertion, then you divide the central tendon to get mobility of the urethra. So here's what you got. Right now in that upper picture, we've made our midline perineal incision. We've opened up bulbospongiosis muscle, which is retracted laterally with the retractor. What we've done in that upper picture is we're placing a 2 PDS we're placing it into the spongiosum where the central tendon inserts. Okay, so we identify where the central tendon inserts into the spongiosum, put that figure of eight to a PDS stitch, we tie that, and then in the lower picture, that stitch is on tension, placing the central tendon under tension. And the central tendon is at the tips of the Metzenbaum scissors. In that picture, it looks like kind of a, kind of a pale white line. Uh, and we want to divide that central tendon to get mobility of the ball by urethra. So we divide the central tendon. The next step is going to be to pass our helical needles. And, and, and to, make a, to make a long story a little shorter, you want to pass these helical needles such that the tips come out on the undersurface of the ramus, right where the, ram, right where the uh, ischiopubic ramus and the symphysis meet one another. So if you look at that picture on the bottom left, that helical needle tip has passed through the external obturator membrane, through the internal obturator membrane, through the obturator foramen, and then it's gonna be exiting out high on the undersurface of the ramus, and you do that because that's where you want the arm of the mesh, and you can see that on that picture on the right. In the operating room, here's what it looks like. 
this is me uh, and I'm working on the patient's left side. So I'm controlling the handle of the helical needle with my right hand. And then my left hand, the index finger is in the perineal incision right at the very top of the ramus. My thumb of the left hand is going to drive that needle in and causing the needle tip to, to go through the external and then the internal obturator membranes through the obturator foramen and then come out onto the index finger, which is placed right at that upper margin of the ipsilateral ischiopubic ramus, right where it meets the symphysis. Once you've done that, you snap the arm of the mesh onto that helical needle and then, and then back that out back through the stab incision. You do that on both sides. And then you secure the mesh to the corpus spongiosum. And the proximal edge of the mesh needs to be secured to the spongiosum right where the central tendon inserts. And so we pass those stitches of that PDS, the arms of that stitch, pass it through pores on the proximal edge of the mesh and tie it down. Then you secure the distal edge of the mesh to the spongiosum with another PDS stitch. Then you remove the catheter and you tension the sling. Uh, you could tension with the catheter in place or remove the catheter. I don't think I've done it both ways. I don't think it makes any difference in ultimate efficacy. I'm just in the habit of pulling the catheter out. But you tension the arms of the mesh. You pull on the arms of the mesh until you get resistance and movement stops. And you get what I call a clamshelling of the mesh. The mesh kind of folds back on itself. And if we look at these pictures from the operating room, that upper picture, that is the, the uh, PDS stitch being passed through pores in the proximal edge of the mesh, and then you tie it down. And the bottom picture, I'm securing the distal edge of the mesh to the spongiosum with another PDS stitch. So there it is in the top picture, the mesh is secured. You can't see the bottom stitch, uh, but you can see the top one securing the distal edge of the mesh. And then I place tension, pull up on the arms of the sling, and that causes that mesh to kind of clamshell back on itself, fold back on itself, and that's exactly what you want to see. Now, in the operating room, I don't do cystoscopy. You certainly can if you want to. I don't think it changes the outcome. I don't do cystoscopy. I simply tension the arms of the mesh till I see that clamshelling. And then once I've done that, in my case, I put the catheter back in, uh, and then I remove the sheathing from the arms of the mesh, and then I trim the arms of the mesh just below the stab incisions and the inguinal creases. I leave a Foley in for about 24, 36 hours, give the patient a voiding trial. In my hands, about 84, 85% of those men will void fine at 24 hours, but about 15 or 16% won't. I don't sweat it. Simply put a catheter back in, leave it in for about a week, and then take it out, and virtually everybody is voiding after that second voiding trial. There's a small percent that won't. I mean, really small, 1% or less. If they don't, don't sweat it. Don't think you have to jump back in and do something. I put them on intermittent catheterization, self-cath, and they all come out of uh, their retention. Uh, I give them limited activity for about three weeks, uh, and then they, then they can begin normal activities after that. These are my personal numbers. This has this has stayed very consistent through my times with uh, uh, Advance XP. Uh, is that about 82, 83 percent of these men who are good candidates uh, will will have will, will no longer need pads. Dean Knoll, one of my mentors up in Nashville, same kind of numbers. Alan Morey, same kind of numbers. So I think this success meaning no more pads in the ideal patient with a sling is really i think you can get that 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 you know 81 82 83 percent of these guys really shouldn't need pads anymore so i think that in the right patient with the right technique the male sling is the ideal treatment uh, i encourage you if you haven't used advance xp and you've got good patients then use advance xp it's a really good product no it's not for everybody you want to use it on the ideal candidate but i think it's a very viable option thanks for paying attention